How's everyone doing? Got that wonderful lunch out there? All right. Uh, my name is Christian Henry, and I'm the CEO of PacBio, and I just wanted to welcome you to our, our workshop. It's going to be a lot of a very interesting hour, and uh, I'm not going to spend too much time, but I want to make sure that uh, hopefully uh, you've uh, registered to attend our event tonight. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, speculation about what Grammy-winning artist is going to be there, but I, I've sworn to secrecy, so uh, I won't be able to say anything there. Just one other note, you know, 2023 has been a remarkable year for PacBio. I think the launch of Revio last year uh, and the announcement and then subsequent shipments this year have been uh, really nothing short of, of tremendous, and I just want to personally thank all of you our customers and partners and friends uh, for your, you know, basically for your unwavering support as we've kind of grown and scaled. It's so exciting to see the biology that's uh, being unlocked with this platform. And you're going to hear a lot about that now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jonas Korlak, our, one of our founders, and, uh, and uh, he can get us started. So thank you guys again. Enjoy the talk. And hopefully I'll get to see some of you this evening in uh, you know, in a little more le in a little less formal uh, circumstance. So, cheers. Thank you, Christian, and hello from me as well. I'm Jonas Korlach. I'm Chief Science Officer at PacBio, and it's really a pleasure to uh, host this event uh, today. Uh, the theme is to uh, highlight some of the breakthrough discoveries in multiple omes, the genomes, the epigenome, and transcriptomes with HiFi long read sequencing. Uh, we have a great program for you. Um, both Andrew and Gloria will speak today to you about their experience with the technology. But first, allow me to say a few words. Um, as Christian mentioned, this is actually uh, the birthday of uh, Revio and Onso. Uh, and I see many, many of you were here about a year ago. Um, and some of you are at the previous party. And uh, so it's been just a really tremendous year. And, and we remember it very fondly. And I hope you do as well. Uh, there's been so much going on over the past 12 months. Uh, we started shipping Revio worldwide in March, and then on, so we started more recently shipping in August. And we've, it's been so great to see the enthusiasm by all of you getting the platform and then getting it going. And pretty soon after shipment, the Revio gigabases started rolling in. And uh, we've seen, again, on social media, people starting little Olympics of who can get the most runs and who can get the highest yield and so forth. Just really uh, tremendous, uh, the engagement. More systematically, we've seen a very rapid adoption. It's been the most rapid adoption of any of our platforms. And in September, all of our users combined, this is a cumulative total raw sequencing data, surpassed eight petabases. That's eight billion uh, 8 million billion bases. And that's just a testament to the much higher throughput, Revio having a 15 times higher throughput than the predecessor, the SQL 2E. And just to give you a perspective of that throughput, the uh, blue bar represents the maximum monthly throughput output that we've ever had from the much, much larger SQL uh, 2E fleet. So by now, even having fewer instruments, they're now putting out way more data uh, compared to what the entire SQL 2 fleet uh, did in the past. And we've already, even though it's only been a little more than half a year that um, the Revio system has been in your hands, we've seen multiple publications highlighting that the data quality is indistinguishable between SQL 2 and Revio, but of course significantly increased throughput and thereby the decreased cost. Um, the second paper uh, from Taishel Turner of WashU showing consistency for all the different metrics that you care about, coverage, detection of variation, methylation calling, which is part of the workflow, um, and the de novo assemblies. And thereby, in this review article by Evan Eichler and others, uh, concluding that Revio will allow more researchers to now ex access high-quality, long-read whole genome sequencing data. Here's another one um, that extended um, the support of the bioinformatics software to small variant calling, single nucleotide variants and indel callings, finding uh, excellent performance and concluding that Revio is high throughput and much more practical for large-scale studies. I'm just going to mention one more. The researchers at Children's Mercy Kansas City announced that they have a program to now sequence at least 1,000 pediatric um, individuals through their program per year at, uh, at Children's Mercy. There are two more papers. I'm not going to talk about them because that's the work of Andrew Stagakis, our next speaker, and so I don't want to steal his thunder. 
In terms of updates and news, um, a little while ago we announced that we now have a complete computational workflow for human whole genome sequencing data analysis. This is the most comprehensive and complete um, computational analysis pipeline for whole genome sequencing ever created. It combines over a dozen or so um, workflows for variant calling, for methylation calling, for phasing, CNVs, for methylation annotation. It incorporates both PEC bio tools for uh, looking at tandem repeats and segmental duplications. It incorporates third party tools with uh, Google Deep Variant. And it is also um, available both on premise and um, uh, in the cloud with Google Cloud, Azure and, um, and uh, AWS, Amazon. It is also available on multiple cloud vendors, DNA Nexus, FormBiome, uh, Terra, DNA Stack. Uh, then um, yesterday we announced that we have partnered with both GeneYx and Golden Helix on the tertiary analysis. Once you have all those variant calls and all the other information for what we call a fully featured human genome, uh, how can you relate that to the tertiary and the learning that you can get from all this information? Uh, moreover, um, today we announced uh, the Hi-Fi Solves Consortium, and I hope some of you had a chance to see Alex Heuschen in the CoLab talk earlier today um, describing this consortium in Europe uh, combining six different sites and looking more deeply into the underlying uh, causes for various diseases. Um, then tomorrow morning, there will be another CoLab session by um, David Porupski, who works in Evan Eichler's lab, and our very own Zef Cronenberg on a platinum pedigree truth set. So it's, of course, very important to now establish much better, much more complete truth sets, and um, they will talk about that. I also just learned that Zef's poster, 3334, uh, uh, has been awarded the Reviewer's Choice Award, so uh, please check that out. On the upfront side, we have um, for a while already had the Hamilton as a fully automated solution for library prep. We've added new PEC biocompatible partners, TCAN, Integra, Revity, so that this really um, makes it more flexible and for the fluids, uh, fluid handling systems that you have in your lab. And so all that combined really now completes the end-to-end -end workflow that we can offer to all of you from the DNA isolation and extraction with our nanobind, high fruit nanobind uh, kits, the sample prep of all the PEC biocompatible partners, the sequencing on the Revio with the preload feature that allows you to really run it 24 seven, and as I mentioned, the secondary and tertiary analysis for this fully featured genome. So that's on the DNA side, what about RNA? On the RNA side, over the past, I would say, three or four years with the uh, introduction of the isoseq method, it's been demonstrated that isoforms play a really critical role in human biology, health, and disease. The ENCODE uh, 4 um, atlas now includes long-read data and isoforms, and finding that for three quarters of human genes, there's more than one predominant isoforms. Um, another paper all, all, only about three weeks ago showing how radical protein conformational changes can arise from just subtle changes in the isoform sequence, and I think Gloria will talk a lot more about that. Um, the risk genes for disease, so neurodevelopmental disease risk genes are strongly associated with the number of unique isoforms, not gene expression. Uh, almost 3,000 genes are heritable only at the isoform level, and on and on and on. There are many, many more papers like this that are coming out really thick and fast, and and just to uh, highlight this point, I was done with all my slides on Sunday evening, and then on Monday morning, there's this tremendous new paper by Bobby Sieber at Mount Sinai showing how isoforms are really critical in understanding uh, human preamplitation embryos and showing that the transcriptome is far more complex from the isoform level that's currently known. It's fair to say that uh, all of these projects were significant projects because of the throughput that previously was relatively low for ISOSEQ. Each transcript was one read, and so um, we had to address uh, this throughput limitation with the Revio and with what we were very proud to announce at this meeting, the new uh, product line of Kinex kits for scalable, cost-effective RNA sequencing. So very briefly how it works, um, you have a gene with many different isoforms, and then these uh, RNA full-length isoforms are transcribed, um, reverse transcribed, and then double-stranded cDNA is formed for different isoforms. 
you may have more than, uh, and then you have other genes and other isoforms. And then those full length cDNA sequences are stitched together. They're concatenated into a longer molecule of about 15 to 20,000 um, base pairs, taking full advantage of the optimum capacity of hi-fi sequencing. This technology was developed by the Broad Institute called MassSeq, and we have now productized it for both bulk and single cell RNA sequencing. So very briefly, these are now, um, we are announcing these as kits that give you 40 million full length reads per Revio smart cell. That's a 16 times higher throughput compared to the SQL 2E system with the previous ISOSeq method. There are various barcoding strategies that allowed you to barcode and pool many different samples. And then SmartLink, our analysis software, automatically uh, deconcatenates the reads and generates the isoform classification. So you may ask, well, how much is 40 million reads? And I want to emphasize that there is so much more information content in a full length RNA sequencing read so that you should not compare it directly to the short read RNA-seq data that really cannot get at the alternative splicing at the isoform information. So on the lower right, you see a, a titration experiment showing that at 10 million reads for all these samples, you're getting to 80% of everything there's to know about that sample, and at 20 million, you basically saturate the discovery. And then uh, just to show that these are full-length transcripts, here are the very typical distributions with the peak of the distributions at two or three kilobases and having a tail going all the way out to as, as large as 10 kilobase uh, transcripts. With regard to single cell RNA, this is an upgrade to a previous kit that we had um, and this now is uh, compatible with the Chromium uh, 10X system and both now for the three prime kit as well as, and this is new for the five prime kit, what is also new is the barcoding capability, and here you uh, can achieve 80 to 100 million reads per smart cell from a Revio, from a single Revio smart cell, again with the analysis support, and that allows you to see more cellular identities because alternative splicing often contributes to giving that cell its specific function, its specific identity. So that's, uh, I think, uh, those were my introductory remarks and maybe a good transition to now um, pass it to Andrew, who is going to talk about really um, taking all that information on the genome side and the RNA side and putting it into the multiome. So Andrew? Perfect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I'm really excited to share some of the ongoing research in our laboratory as well as the recent preprint that we have. So we've had the ability clinically to do what we've called whole genome sequencing for around a decade, but once we actually get the data back, we essentially just look at the exome. That's kind of the standard approach for actually doing genomic testing nowadays, and it's not great. If we're really going to start to want to look into the non-coding genome, we need to start to asking ourselves, well, how do we actually approach that problem in a very systematic perspective? And that's what I'll go over today um, in this uh, talk. But really, it's important to recognize sort of why is this a problem? And really, it's a problem for two major reasons. You know, one is both the scale. There's just a lot more variance in the non-coding genome than there is in the coding genome, which just presents a much bigger challenge when it comes to interpreting um, all these variants. And the other is in terms of scope. In the coding genome, you have something called the codon, which is lovely. You can just take your variant, plug it into that, look it up, what is the predicted function. With non-coding variants, individual variants can cause disease via a plethora of different mechanisms, and individual variants themselves may actually cause disease via multiple mechanisms simultaneously, thus confounding a lot of sort of the approaches that we've had to actually evaluate these types of variants. Traditionally, how we've resolved this is by not just looking at the genome, but actually looking at the functional output of the genome as well and using that to help interpret these non-coding variants. For example, pairing RNA sequencing with um, whole genome sequencing can be, can be very beneficial for evaluating different types of splicing and other such related variants. And similarly, applying chromatin-based assays like ATAC, seq high c you name it, to whole genome sequencing can be important for evaluating these types of methodologies. And it's very important to recognize as well that all this functional data exists within the cell, the same cells that have 
the DNA, but yet our current paradigm for actually doing genetic testing is to essentially just strip all that away and just focusing on the DNA and ignoring all of the functional data that actually was present in those cells simultaneously. And really today what I'm going to be talking about is how we can sort of kind of try to shift away from that paradigm of just looking at the genome and actually start to understand the function of non-coding variants by taking it into account the actual environment, the cellular environment that the genome was actually present in before we actually did the isolation. So to accomplish this, really we're going to be using two different technologies. One is this full-length transcript sequencing that connects, as um, um, Jonas just did a great job sort of introducing, as well as another technology called FiberSeq, which I'll go over a little bit as well. And really the benefit of this is by combining these two together, you're able to now get a much better picture, not of just the genome, but actually the functional interpretation of that in terms of the CPG methylation chromatin state, as well as the transcript and output of the genome itself. So to go over FiberSeq, so what this methodology really is, is just a sort of a modified DNA extraction protocol where what you're doing is rather than just stripping all the proteins off the DNA, you actually end up spray painting the um, genome using a nonspecific adenine methyltransferase, which will essentially result in a stencil of where every single protein was bound along that genome. And specifically for this, we're using the adenine methyltransferase because adenine methylation is not appreciably present in human tissues. So we know if we see it, we caused it to be there. And then to actually detect this, we're using this sort of standard PAC biosequencing um, to get all the genetic data out of this because you get sort of your standard, you know, hi-fi quality and your ability to phase stuff for very long reads. But in addition, we actually wrote a, a separate tool which now will take that um, uh, kinetic data that comes with the pac bio sequencing, and not only does it identify the CPG methylation, which is natively done with the Primrose or Jasmine pipeline, but now we actually have a pipeline that will uh, detect the adenine methylation on every single molecule, which is sort of these stencils of where proteins were bound. So what does this data actually look like? So this is just an example of a read, which obviously is much longer than what the screen would be, but there's a segment of it, that gray bar. And what you can appreciate, these individual purple dashes are actually sites of adenine methylation. And you can appreciate the predominant your signal you're seeing on this one read is a lot of single mononucleosome footprints and then some larger areas of accessibility like this. But the benefit of having, you know, deep Revio type sequencing with it is you don't just get one read, you get 30x coverage of the genome with every single run. And this enables you to start to appreciate how chromatin is actually organized on every single read within that cell type. But because this is grounded in long read sequencing, you can haplotype phase everything quite readily, you know, using the underlying genetic data that comes with this. We've subsequently developed the semi-supervised machine learning approach that then takes this um, single molecule M6A marks and actually calls chromatin accessibility on a per molecule basis. So you can actually distinguish which are sites of sort of standard or expected internucleosomal linker regions as well as sites of accessible chromatin. I really have to give a huge shout out to Mitchell Volger, an outstanding postdoc in the lab who really has sort of pioneered the work in terms of doing this machine learning approach for this. And then the best part of this is you can actually do something which I've always wanted to do as part of the ENCODE project but was never able to do this, which is you can actually create completely haplotype resolved maps of chromatin architecture. And for example, I can say that, you know, within the maternal haplotype there is no accessibility versus in the paternal haplotype you now have these focal areas of chromatin accessibility you can use to actually identify haplotype specific patterns. And this is important, especially when it comes to Mendelian conditions. As we know, a lot of Mendelian conditions are out there are going to be caused by heterozygote or compound heterozygote variants. So as a result, if you have a haplotyped phased epigenome, you can essentially leverage the two haplotypes as an internal control and ask whether or not there are specific spots along the genome where you have this divergence in terms of the chromatin accessibility between haplotype 1 and haplotype 2. We can do this genome-wide as part, actually, as part of our standard fire pipeline. This is automatically computed for every single sample you do in there. And you can do simple sort of bond for corrections, identify those sites along the genome where you have significant haplotype-specific chromatin architectures. As you'd expect, many of these are at imprinted loci, but a lot of these are not. And if you go drill down, these are actually sites which are caused to be haplotype-specific because there's actually genetic variants that are disrupting transcription factor occupancy or other chromatin patterns specific to one of those two haplotypes. 
So I'm not going to spend that much time on the full-length transcript sequencing background because Jonas did a wonderful job at that. But essentially, we are leveraging this um, uh, Connects kit to really get this benefit in terms of how we can go after the transcriptome simultaneously, um, as well as this chromatin data. So how do we combine this? So essentially, you can imagine, this is actually what we're going to be doing, um, is you can take a sample, so a cell line from an individual or sort of what cell line or tissue, you name it, you can take that sample, do the fiber-seq reaction, you know, push that together in terms of a smarts library. We have similarly isolate the RNA, cDNA, go into the sort of connects library kit. And actually for this pilot, which I'm going to be showing you, is that we actually just pooled these together and sequenced them on the same smart cell. So what we're having here is one smart cell, so your sort of standard smart cell that you would have just gotten your genome with. Now we're getting all this rich information simultaneously. So we now have the ability to get the genome, the CPG methylome, your chromatin epigenome, and transcriptome. So before we wanted to use this, you know, as sort of part of a research study as part of the Undiagnosed Disease Network, we first wanted to validate is this actually giving us sort of the integral utility that we were sort of anticipating that it potentially would. And to do that, we actually validated this approach on two genome in a bottle cell types, so HG001 and HG002. I'm just showing the data here for HG002, but if you look at the preprint, you can see all the data for HG001. And it's important to recognize that we're getting, you know, um, a very high quality, you know, genetic data directly out of this approach. But in addition to all this high quality genomic data, we're also getting this wealth of functional information that helps us interpret all these genetic variants that we're actually seeing, including full length transcripts, CPG, chromatin accessibility, you name it. So what does this actually look like? So if you imagine if you just had your you know, long read genomic data in and of itself, this would be your ability to sort of haplotype phase the two haplotypes right there. But we can pile on top of this using the exact same data from the sequencing run your CPG methylation information, your chromatin information, and then your transcript information. So now you not only have the sequence that's there, but you now have all the functional output of that sequence simultaneously that you can use to evaluate what actually is going on at these you know, non-coding variants that you've identified and sort of you know, maybe tiered in terms of your analysis approach, but don't actually understand what the functional result of that actually is. So this happens to be an imprinted locus where you can quite cleanly see the differences in terms of how the transcription as well as the CPG and chromatin data is patterned across the two haplotypes. So now in terms of how we can use this. So really the goal of this wasn't necessarily just to sort of, you know, make a cool assay that we can do for our own simultaneously. It was sort of asking the questions, can we actually use this to help improve the diagnosis of individuals with rare diseases? And so this is actually a case um, uh, which is a patient which we recruited into our local undiagnosed disease network where we really wanted to see can we leverage this sort of technology to better understand what is actually causing her disease. And this is a nine-month-old with bilateral retinoblastomas, polymicrogyria, sensor neural hearing loss, hypotonia, lactic acidosis, and some dysmorphic um, features, and no family history of any of this. As you could expect, you know, as with many of the individuals coming into the Undiagnosed Disease Network, she had a previously quite extensive evaluation to this. TRIO whole genome sequencing was unremarkable. Um, Ray was unremarkable. She, because of the retinoblastomas, they did Sanger sequencing the RB1 gene itself, which was unremarkable, and they actually did RNA sequencing the RB1 gene, which was slightly low end of normal. She ended up getting a karyotype which identified this chromosome X13 translocation, which um, then karyotyping of her parents demonstrated this was actually de novo in nature. And really the question that we had is, for most balanced translocations like this, they're actually not really associated with disease. And if they are associated with disease, they can actually cause disease via a plethora of different mechanisms. So really we want to know is could this translocation actually be contributing to her phenotype? So to approach this, we took fibroblasts from this individual, applied this um, long read multi-am approach to it, um, and sort of looked at to see whether or not we can help resolve this. With this, as you can imagine, we were able to precisely map the breakpoints in and of themselves using the long read data, and this showed that this truly was indeed a simple, balanced translocation genetically. There wasn't anything more complex genetically than that. If you drill down to the actual sites of the translocation, which we can you know, sort of uh, see, we actually found that this translocation disrupts the gene NBEA. 
This is a gene that's associated with an autosomal dominant neurodevelopmental disorder, which is usually caused by a loss of function phenotype. And this particular location where it disrupts it would, um, is predicted to result in nonsense mediated decay of the actual gene on this site. And importantly, the non-translocated chromosome, so the intact copy of chromosome 13, had an intact copy of this gene NBEA. So only one of the two copies was truly disrupted in this individual. However, if we just stopped at the genetics, we would have been missing a the majority of her actual diagnosis, as I'll go over in the next couple of slides, and really was the addition of the transcriptomic data plus the chromatin data that really sort of enabled us to resolve what was actually going on in this individual. For example, if we actually look at the other side of this translocation on the derivative 13, there's a gene called PDK3, which usually should be on chromosome X. But actually, right now, PDK3 is on this derivative chromosome, and actually the breakpoint or the fusion is right in the last intron of PDK3 isoform 2 and actually puts the PDK3 gene just upstream of the MAB21L1 gene in the same orientation. And when we were looking at the transcript data, we actually saw individual full-length transcript reads which actually correspond to fusion transcripts um, between both the PDK3 and the MAB21L1 gene, demonstrating that this genomic fusion was actually creating a transcript fusion event for her. The other thing which is interesting about this is, as many of you guys know, is, you know, this would have resulted in transcription through this fusion gene that actually would result in transcription of the endogenous MAB21L1 promoter. And transcriptional read-through of a promoter can cause a variety of different impacts. You know, for example, it's well known within the Lynch syndrome that transcriptional read-through of the MSH2 um, promoter via an EPCAM deletion can result in transcriptional read-through silencing of that, of that promoter. So we want to actually see if a similar thing is actually going on in this um, individual. And by integrating the CPG methylation as well as the transcript data, because we we're able to phase the transcripts across the two haplotypes, we we're able to show that yes, indeed, what's going on here is that this fusion transcript is actually resulting in transcriptional read through silencing of the endogenous MAB2101 promoter. So essentially, on the haplotype that contains this um, a, a derivative chromosome, all of the MAB21L1. Um, gene products are actually coming out of this fusion and not actually from that protein um, or that gene's promoter itself. The other thing that's interesting about this is you can imagine, well, now I just brought MAB21L1 next to PDK3. So it's possible that PDK3 could be actually adopting some of the MAB21L1 enhancer elements by doing this fusion event. And so that's actually the next question we wanted to ask is could that be the case? And for that, we really leveraged the chromatin data that we got simultaneously with this. And specifically, if you look at the, in, the intact copy of chromosome 13 in this patient, so as we were able to haplotype phase all the chromatin, we can sort of separate this out quite easily. We found that there was a strong enhancer element that was located downstream of the MAB21L1 gene that looked like on a per molecule basis was actually codependent with the promoter of MAB21L1 in and of itself. And one interesting thing about this particular element is it actually is a very tissue specific element. So we actually created retinal organoids from this um, fibroblast line from this individual and showed that this particular element was actually highly accessible selectively in the retinal organoids compared to the fibroblast in and of itself. And so what we wanted to ask is, well, is this particular enhancer element on the fusion or the derivative um, copy of the chromosome actually impacting PDK3 protein or gene expression in and of itself? And one thing that's important is, as I mentioned earlier, this you know, putative enhancement element is located downstream of MAB21L1, so it's actually not being subjected to the transcriptional read-through silencing because it's after the transcriptional termination for this fusion transcript. And so to address this question, we ended up actually just doing simple sort of um, uh, Western blotting on both the control cell line as well as the patient's um, retinal organoids and showed that truly indeed actually the PDK3 protein is enhanced in terms of its expression selectively within this patient, demonstrating that yes, this PDK3 is adopting a novel chromatin state selectively in this patient likely as a result of this enhancer adoption event. So, Finally, you know, I mentioned this was a chromosome X13 translocation. And that 
evokes a little bit of interest for us, and specifically because there's actually another case report from a couple of years ago which described a chromosome X13 translocation for the opposite arm of chromosome X. And this individual, similar to our patient, had um, bilateral retinoblastomas. And one of the things that they actually showed in this paper was the reason why they developed bilateral retinoblastomas is there was actually spreading of X chromosome inactivation on that derivative X chromosome from sort of the X portion of it into this autosomal 13 area, which included the RB1 gene on that derivative X. And so we wanted to leverage the chromatin data to see whether or not that was similarly going on in our individual. And what we found was that, you know, in our patient, the far majority of X inactivation was actually being specific to the intact copy of the X. So in around 97% of our cells, the intact copy of X was being preferentially inactivated, not the derivative X. However, in around 3% of cells, the derivative X was being inactivated, and the inactivation on that we could show is actually spreading into the autosomal part on that derivative X, so actually spreading specifically into the RB1 locus, in of itself causing this sort of somatic silencing via an X inactivation spreading event. So how has this been helpful? So you sort of started off with this genetic observation, which is a chromosome X13 translocation, and then the clinical observation, which is a patient's phenotype, which I'm sort of lifting up, listing up here on the left. Just using the genomic data, we're able to say that yes, this individual likely has H, um, NBEA haploinsufficiency, and that likely explains only part of her phenotype, because that's only really associated with the global developmental delay phenotype. Using the transcript as well as chromatin data, we're able to demonstrate that the PDK3 gene is actually altered. And specifically, this is altered not in a way that would really result in loss of function, but actually a way that could potentially result in a gain of function via increased expression um, in altered um, cell types as well as this fusion transcript, which is of note because PDK3 is actually an inhibitor of the PDH complex. And so if this is gain of function, you would potentially predict to see more inhibition of the PDH complex, which can result in a large host of conditions such as lactic acidosis, um, polymicrogyria, hypotonia, which this patient actually has. Similarly, this X chromosome inactivation of the RB1 locus is likely the result of actually her bilateral retinoblastomas and clinically means that she's likely going to behave more like a somatic RB1 individual at, rather than an individual who has more of a traditional germline uh, defect in the RB1 gene. And finally, with the MAP21L1 finding, we were able to show that although one of the two loci is, has a, essentially a loss of function, the other locus is intact. And thankfully, actually, MAP21L1, although it's associated with the Mendelian condition, it's only associated with the Mendelian condition in the recessive form. So actually, heterozygous carriers of, carriers of loss of function, MAP21L1, don't have disease. And that's actually consistent with what we see is that her phenotype does not match that of individuals with homozygote loss of function variants in MAP21L1. So really, I hope what I've showed you is that really we can go from this just a sort of genomic centric to really filling out the details of what the functional output of the cell is, you know, within the same sort of sequencing paradigm that we're already using, but just sort of adding on this interpretive imp um, information, which really can be quite pivotal when looking at the non-coding genome. And with that, there's a lot of people to thank, you know, for this. This has been just a really, you know, wonderful collaboration um, with Jonas as well as his team at PacBio. You know, many people at the Pacific Northwest Undiagnosed Disease Network. You know, obviously, you know, really appreciative of the patient and the family. And, you know, Mitchell Volger in the lab has been really instrumental in all of the software tooling that we've been developing. And then Jane and Elliot has really been played a role. And then our other collaborators who helped out with the organoid um, stuff, um, um, Yasmin, um, Kiara, and Tom Ray as well. So, and thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really great. Uh, we're going to hold for questions to make sure Gloria has enough time for her presentation. Both speakers have offered to stay around after the workshop, so if, you, if we don't have enough time, they'll still be available. So next, uh, we have Gloria Schenkman, and uh, looking forward to hearing about your research. Thank you so much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here um, to talk to you about, I guess, continuing along the central dogma. So Andrew just told a lovely story about how um, with long reads you can really pinpoint uh, functional elements in the uh, human genome. Um, what my lab focuses on is what are the products of the genome, and um, we're working on various approaches 
um, that it incorporates PacBio data as a longtime user of it. So talk, talk outline is, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of philosophy. I, not, not a lot of people, well hopefully this will change, but not a lot of people um, have such a, a proteome uh, rooted perspective at looking at the genome, but hopefully we can change that. Um, I'd like to share a little vignette about how we are integrating genomic and proteomics data, and then end with some of the technologies that I feel like um, uh, are, are, are exciting that are, is coming out of our labs and other uh, collaborating labs. So to start, really the central point of my whole talk is I think that long read RNA-seq is a bridge between genomics and proteomics. The genome has, actually I learned a lot <laughs> just now with Andrew's talk, there's a lot going on in terms of the regulation, but it, it's actually the template to produce an astounding amount of diversity at the proteome. From one gene, one of our 20,000 genes, there are millions of proteoforms that you're producing right now as you sit in your um, chair. And, um, really our ability to measure these molecules I think have, has far surpassed our ability to interpret them and, um, and analyze them. And so um, it's just not that the fact that these proteins are, are, are there. They are functionally uh, distinct and um, we have many examples that abound. A small change in a uh, protein sequence from a single amino acid to uh, changing of, of a domain can change the localization of a protein, can um, be the difference between um, normal oxidative phosphorylation to a Warburg effect that drives a, cancer's, a cancer patient's tumor. And you know, I think these examples have been shared quite often. You probably know about BCL2 like one. I, I love that example. It's in high school textbooks. But I think what, um, what is not as well known is that this is actually a global phenomenon. This is not just a, you know, uh, an example that it has been cherry picked. So while I was a postdoc at Harvard Medical School within Mark Vidal's lab, um, we had employed a high throughput approach, so a genome scale approach to actually measure protein isoform function. And we found that over half of protein isoform pairs that we were able to measure, they have different interactions. We have to start treating them like different gene products. They are not just minor variants of each other. And it's really important to you have technologies to measure the molecules that are in, 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 the, in patients. So um, really, this has been a driving force for my whole career. Um, from proteomics to genomics and back again. So my graduate work was asking the question, how do we leverage new analytical technologies, long read sequencing, mass spec proteomics, to measure proteoforms? And then um, the, uh, you know, the other side of the question is once you, once you discover a novel proteoform, you immediately want to ask yourself, what is its functional significance? So um, yeah, I think high throughput approaches and uh, especially network biology modeling approaches are really important to um, yeah, put proteoforms in context. And then now um, I've arrived, I think been here for a couple, a couple years at the University of Virginia in my own independent lab, this wonderful group of people. How do we um, leverage the ability to measure proteoforms and functionally contextualize them and bring it into the clinic, something that could actually make a difference in a patient's life? And I just, a little turn, but a little uh, history. Um, so I did my uh, graduate work with Lloyd Smith, and actually I feel like this all started in the 1980s, so like 30, 40 years ago in a basement back at Caltech. Um, so Lloyd Smith was, uh, when he worked with Lee Hood, he had developed the automated Sanger sequencer, and that's actually a picture of it with the big slab gel. And um, I find it kind of miraculous that like 35 years later, I joined his lab and, and, and then used PacBio, which is basically 25 million lo Lloydies uh, in the zero mode wave guys. We basically miniaturized this guy and his automated Sanger sequencer, and now it's like pretty remarkable with the Revio, we can sequence 25 million, um, I mean millions, billions of reads. So with that information, with these high accuracy, full length transcript, transcript reads, I, I feel like we're really benefiting from this technological advancement, and um, I think a lot of others are, and actually there's much more that could happen. And so kind of going back to this connection between the genome and the proteome, there are strong threads, there really are strong threads that connect genome to the proteome. Um, not literally, but figuratively. The genome has myriad 
of different variations, which many of you know very well, SNPs and um, you know, copy number variations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The genome is kind of like the sticks of a puppet, a controller. And given somebody's genetic background, it influences what proteins are produced, just like uh, sticks um, of a puppet can control what a puppet looks like. So one individual might have one variation and produce this set of protein isoform. A, a different individual has other variation, either uh, de novo mutation or related to their ancestry, they're producing a slightly different proteoform. And this is the information I think we need to have uh, available to us readily. Um, because it's been really clear through anywhere from Mendelian studies on diagnosed disease to GWAS, we have such large catalogs of uh, genetic loci associated with traits, and there's uh, accumulating evidence out of all, a lot of the different mechanisms. Alternative splicing is a clear, clear mechanism that is driving disease. And so I'd like to just share with you um, for the, the middle part of the talk a little vignette about how we're trying to link this information. Um, uh, this is a joint project, and actually, I think Arby, Dr. Arby Boot, is might be over there, no, I, or he maybe he disappeared. Oh, you're gone. He's, he left. Anyways, I'm talking about his project. Um, this is a joint collaboration with Dr. Charles Farber. He's the director of the Center for Public Health Genomics at the University of Virginia. Um, and just a little plug, they have a booth, and they're like hiring, and it's amazing. So if you're thinking about some career, you know, moves, you should definitely talk to them. So in this joint project, um, so the Farber Lab uh, is interested in a complex disease, osteoporosis, and like most complex diseases. We have loci. We have hundreds of loci associated with the trait. Many of these variants are non-coding. And you can do functional genomic studies and find all across, that, uh, all across the genome um, the sites that are associated with, um, um, with splicing. However, these are individual junctions, individual exons. This, a lot of this data is coming from short read sequencing. So you don't really know, molecularly speaking, what is happening to the protein isoform. So the idea that we had is what if we collected long read sequencing data on the disease tissue of relevance, in this case these are bone cells that we can uh, culture in the lab, um, as they're differentiating, so osteoblasts are bone forming cells. So we, pr we did precisely that, collected uh, deep coverage, Pack biosequencing across um, several several time points, and from all of this information, we were able to construct a bone uh, bone cell specific transcriptome and proteome. And so, we putting all of this data together, um, you you're actually looking, and it looks very um, you know involved, but really this is this is quite cool because you, you're seeing the lead SNP, the sqtl the transcript isoforms, and we've actually predicted the full-length proteins. And then if you go further down in the track, we, we have now created a connection between the genotype and potential protein function. Um, so um, gathering all of this data, Arby had found, um, we actually had many candidates. Um, just to kind of give you a highlight, one of our top candidates was TPM2, um, which it, it didn't make any sense why this would be involved with um, a bone disease, because this is like a muscle, a structural uh, a gene. Had a really good genetic signal, um, really nice effect size in terms of splicing changes, but there were a lot of SQTLs, um, and it was not clear from the short read data what exactly the prote protein forms were that were um, at play. And interestingly enough, when we went into the lab and knocked out the gene, the full gene, there was no phenotype. But every time we modulated the ratio of these different isoforms, which we could only find with long ray data, the bone mineral density went up and down, or the mineralization of these cells went up and down. So I thought, wow, this is really cool. This is, this is a way where we can find a proteoform driving disease in a systematic way, and with long reads, that was really key to finding that discovery. So where, where are we now? Um, you probably notice technology has a really big role to play in what we're able to see. And um, so I'd just like to share with you a couple things that um, our lab's working on, and I think new technologies that might be enabled with the new Connects kit, with just when, whenever, 
I think it's David Walt who said this, who it was the inventor of Celexa. Whenever you see a technology increase in throughput by tenfold, start to pay attention because you can start to do things you maybe didn't imagine was, was, was possible. Um, one example, proteogenomics. So my, my, my lab is um, very interested in um, not only measuring the RNA molecules, which is important, but also are the proteins there? Just because the transcript is there doesn't, doesn't mean that a protein is necessarily um, stable or, um, and you can always get more information by integrating multiple omics strategies. And so um, uh, in this approach uh, with mass spectrometry-based proteomics, um, you can uh, measure, we typically measure peptides and, and proteins, and, and this is a story for another day, but a lot of the developments there are, are quite interesting. But really the, the outcome of all of this is that you, we're predicting protein isoforms, and now we can directly detect those, um, those, those uh, protein forms and confirm, is that protein stable? What, what is that protein interacting with? And we actually need this because if you try to look for, um, look in a database, most of the proteoforms that you are going to discover do not have uh, an ascribed function. They have probably never been studied before. Um, and so that's why tools are very important. Open source tools are very important. So um, I think Andis Lutmes might be here. So this is, um, this is a tool that our lab, uh, along with others, uh, kind of developed. Uh, we call it Long Read Proteogenomics. It's open source. It was actually um, derived, we created it one weekend um, during a hackathon. <laughs> And, um, and, and basically the idea is you would collect long read RNA-seq data and proteomics data. From the long read data, you derive a patient, well, the dream is a patient-specific uh, proteome, so you predict open reading frames, you automatically annotate what is, the, what is novel about the protein form, and then you're able to uh, validate whether the proteoform is uh, expressed, particularly novel proteoforms. Um, okay, and then another tool, um, second tool I want to describe, is um, uh, something that we realized was a problem um, while we were working with this data, um, which is that the genomics world and the proteomics world, they speak two different languages. They use two different operating systems. Um, pro proteomics uses Microsoft, and you know, it just goes on and on and on. So we realized in order to really integrate genomics and proteomics data, we have to throw everything out and work from the ground up. And so we developed this um, uh, approach called, or this tool called Biosurfer, where we use um, object-oriented um, programming to basically model every aspect from a nucleotide to a codon to an amino acid. And, and you know, our, our, our dream is to be able to make it very easy to go back and forth. There's a lot of um, interesting details that need to be taken care of in this, um, in this integration. And then lastly, I just want to finish up with um, technology is moving really fast. Like I said, when uh, something goes up an order of magnitude, pay attention. And that's why benchmarking is so critical and assessing performance is critical. So we're, as part of um, the Long Read Genome Annotation Assessment Project, um, so our lab was not a participant, but um, we, we were involved in the validation and annotation with the GenCo team. What this project is about is we realize there are a lot of long read sequencing platforms, um, Oxford Nanopore, PacBio, um, synthetic molecular sequencing. And so um, both in human and non-model organisms, direct RNA, cDNA, um, we did a very thorough co uh, comparison, um, and you can find this on, on BioArchive. And what was really beautiful about this is this is purely community-driven, and so we had um, members, uh, many members of the community, kind of submit and um, and rigorously evaluate the results. And the one of the biggest outcomes, which I kind of our lab knew about this for for, for a while, so it wasn't a surprise to us, is that the pack bio reads were. Um, had really long lengths, they had the highest accuracy, and they were most helpful for the annotation. So um, working with the GenCo team, they really relied on the PacBio reads to, conf to um, uh, you know, confirm, like, what, what are the products of, of a gene? Um, you know what the um, complaint, though, was, always, is throughput. Throughput. We want more reads. But now, with Connex, we get it. So um, as a uh, kind of uh, customer, 
um, we, we got a first look at um, a first access of using connects on the same cell line. This is a human stem cell line that was evaluated as part of the, this consortium. And um, I just want to highlight a couple posters. If you're interested, you should um, uh, talk. So one, one, th one thing that's enabled is um, not only identification, but quantification, isoform quantification, differential transcript usage. So David Vessel is presenting a poster um, about this. We're seeing high repeat repeatability and um, uh, many more samples that can be processed to find um, not only minute changes in splicing events, but um, isoform ratios. I also want to highlight the work of Madison Melferber, a graduate student in microbiome. I think she's standing over there. Um, it, with, with more data, you can now start to think about time points. Not only differential transcript usage between a control and uh, disease state, but you can start to think about time points. You can start to think about perturbations and conditions. And so definitely go visit her poster. Um, she'll be talking about um, uh, using this proteogenomics approach for studying endothelial cell differentiation and cardiovascular disease. And then lastly, um, kind of c coming back to um, one of our main focuses is how do we bridge genomics to proteomics. Um, it, uh, tomorrow, there's, uh, I was very excited to see that we finally have um, a, a session that's devoted to proteomics. Um, so walking the dogma of pro proteomics to inform genomic studies. And then Jennifer Korchak here is going to be uh, giving a talk. And so if you're interested in this, you should definitely go, go and see, um, see her work here. Um, so with that, I mean, uh, I would like to acknowledge all of the um, people who have worked hard and the great collaborators as well as the funding sources, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was really terrific. Um, please allow me to make a few concluding remarks. Um, in addition to the, just for completeness, the role of the microbiome, the human microbiome in um, health and disease, of course, has been increasingly recognized. And there's another Kinex kit that we launched alongside with the RNA solutions for, again, over a factor of 10, so over an order of magnitude uh, increase in the overall throughput. It allows up to 1,536 samples with the multiplexing capability and the data analysis capabilities. So now also in the microbiome, you have much higher throughput. And so on the long read side, I'd like to conclude with an observation of what we've been seeing over the past few years relative to trends in the field of genomics. And that is that, of course, uh, previously the main workhorse was short read sequencing. And that uh, made sense because of the throughput and the cost and uh, tremendous advances have been made. However, it's fair to say that over the last three or four years, since the introduction of HiFi sequencing, uh, PEC biotechnology has revealed how much we're missing. And I think um, today you saw two really striking examples of the gaps and the collapsed haplotypes and the missing information that we have in all of these different omics areas. And um, through work from Gloria, from Andrew and others, we've seen that HiFi sequencing can uncover these deficiencies and overcome those limitations, but prior to the Revio system that came at an increased cost and a lower throughput. And now with the Revio system, with the uh, Kinex product line, you no longer have to compromise between data quality and cost and throughput. And so increasingly we are providing these end-to-end -end solutions with the uh, WGS variant calling pipeline with the suite of Kinex um, uh, kits to help you really streamline that and think about large-scale projects. As I mentioned, on the short read platform side, the ONSO system was shipped more recently in August, and um, we've commenced that shipment and shipped multiple systems, uh, orders from 10 plus different countries already, uh, and uh, really the similar kind of excitement now to bring much more accurate short reads for those particular applications where counting really matters or where you're starting with short, re short fragments of DNA, like liquid biopsies, like um, resistance mutation, low level resistance mutation, and infectious disease and so forth. And we've been pleased to see the performance of the system in the hands of our first customers with typical uh, qualification runs of 2 by 150 
giving um, 820 million uh, paired end reads uh, and with the accuracy of 90% of the uh, data being well over Q40, and that's the first commercially available Q40 plus sequencer. And so we encourage you to come to our booth um, and, and check it out there. And then, of course, um, a little while ago, we announced um, the acquisition of a company called Apton, which will accelerate our development process towards going from ONSA, which is a mid-throughput sequencer, to get to much, much higher throughput, again, decreased cost of such a new paradigm shift in higher quality short read data. And this is in development, and you see some of our targets that we have for the system, and uh, stay tuned for more announcements in the, in the uh, future. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and encourage you to connect with us at ASHG, or connects with us, as it were, and we'll, we have booth number 401. Um, we'll hope to see uh, all of you at the party tonight. Um, there's the Truthset collab tomorrow morning, as I mentioned, at 1010. We have a PEC biocompatible passport program. Lots of posters, of course, lots of posters from the community, from you applying the technology, which we're very grateful for. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for coming, and uh, we hope to see all of you at the conference. Thank you.